Okay, we are set to go. Fantastic. Thank you very much for agreeing to meet us. It's lovely to meet At you. At last I see you in person. At last. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Rabia, um, and I'll let my co-curators also introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, I'm Krista, um, and we're very excited to speak to you. I'm very pleased to speak to you. <laughs> awesome. And Matalan is joining He's standing now. on the edge of the world. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> it's Matsalani. like aliens. Matsalani. Matsalani. Yes. Awesome. Hi. Amazing. Great. So we can get started. How are you? Okay. Um, I'll kick us off with our first question, and then we'll take turns asking questions. Um, you've already got them, so I'll start with the first one, which is, could you share a bit more about your background, where you grew up, what attracted you to becoming a theatre maker, um, and, what, and yeah, getting involved in the arts, in art school? Well, Rabia, I've been around for a very long time, <laughs> and you are taking me back to a, a way gone period. Um, I started off my work in, in Durban as a young schoolboy at the age of 15 or 16 mm -hmm. in the theater. And um, I worked my way from about 1964 uh, till I left school and went to varsity. At that time, we went to the, uh, the tribal college, Salisbury Island in the uh, Durban Bay. Yeah. Um, it was an army barracks and it was uh, really a very depressing place. But that's um, the background uh, in which uh, one is plying one's thought in the creative sphere. Mm -hmm. um, so I was part of a group called the Shah Theatre Academy, uh, which um, ran in Durban and was run by uh, Muthal Naidu and uh, Ronnie Govender. And um, that was a group that was inspired uh, by um, a, an American theater director by the name of Krishna Shah, who had come to South Africa on an invitation from um, the Union Artists Group, which was at Dorke House. And um, they, they were the ones that were involved in the famous King Kong. But oh, oh. during that time, um, just after King Kong had gone, um, they did two projects. Um, the one was um, uh, a, a um, Indian classic uh, piece of theater in which they brought um, uh, some um, Indian uh, dancers and so on. And the second was um, a project that was done on um, a play by um, Alan Payton. It was called Spononno. Spononno was um, a very interesting play, but it introduced me more importantly uh, to the work that was being done in Johannesburg at that time. So at a very young age, one is touched by what is happening in the theater nationally. Um, well, we could talk nationally because Johannesburg was the center of it all, mm -hmm. you know. And um, then of course, uh, we, we did a lot of work uh, in Natal, um, touring plays while I was still at school actually, while I was still at school, uh, throughout Natal, taking um, work of social consciousness, should I say, you know. Uh, classics, Clifford Odets, um, people like, um, I'm th thinking now, uh, Arthur Miller, and uh, that sort of work. It was very interesting to work at that time and get the discipline. So I came into the theater um, as a young man, um, still in school, having done a play at school, um, Julius Caesar, I did the famous Julius Caesar. <laughs> and uh, if you were in Julius Caesar, you know you started to cut your teeth in terms of the kind of society we were living in, because Julius Caesar 
um, started to make us think politically uh, in terms of what we were doing in theater. And um, I, I did a couple of things, uh, very interesting things uh, as a schoolboy. Um, and then when I left there, I continued to uh, be associated with the Shah Theatre Academy, but uh, broke away uh, around about 1967. Um, I was working at that time, uh, the two young bucks, should I say, at that point in the Shah Theatre Academy was Sat Scooper and myself. Sat Scooper um, was at school with me. He was a couple of years behind me. But he was um, a guy that was really quite an exciting young man who was interested in so many things that were happening around us. And as a school, school st a youngster, he came to me and said to me, you know, what are you doing? You're always in debates and you are in the speech and speeches and so on and so forth. So that kind of interest um, spurred him on to say, well, uh, maybe I should join the group that you are in. And so he joined me at Shah Theatre Academy, and um, we did a couple of things there. Um, but I like to remember one thing about that grounding, very important grounding, is um, that I learned to come into the theatre, to sweep the floors, and to clean the place, and to respect the reverence of the space of creation. Mm -hmm. And that was the most touching thing for me, besides the content of the work and so on. Um, later on, we were to do um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's um, Men Without Shadows. And um, uh, Satz was there with me at that time. And this was a very interesting piece of work, simply because it drew our attention to the resistance in the last war and um, the French situation. And to work on the work of a great writer like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and a great thinker uh, was important. Uh, for me and for Satz, uh, we were very much drawn towards um, existentialism and uh, that sort of thinking. So theater for us, unlike the older generation that was with us and who were uh, making the theater at that time, for us, it, it had an edge that went beyond just being an actor, mm -hmm. that we were asking questions about the content and the subject and the messages of these pieces of work. And it's that which I think uh, carried me over in the theater and makes me where I am even at this point. Um, uh, when I... Um, left, I was kicked out of varsity, uh, which was uh, quite a regular thing at that time. You know, even Sats uh, was kicked out of varsity because uh, it, was, uh, it was inevitable. You were in a tribal situation, your consciousness is ro uh, arisen, and uh, you cannot stand for the, the kind of closeting that was happening at the university. So you stood up and you, you challenged those things. Mm -hmm. And I took part in the latter part of the um, 60s in a production of um, The Blood Knot uh, by Athel Fugard. Mm -hmm. And um, in doing that piece of work, um, I uh, was playing a light-skinned um, half-caste, should I say, a mixed-race person. And uh, my brother is a, an African man, okay? So I, in order to play the part, you know, in those days we, we weren't allowed to, to play across the line. So um, uh, in fact, in 64, we, we were able to play uh, in the theater with uh, white and other races in the play. But uh, by 64, that was changed. And then in 1969, when I was doing the blood knot, uh, that was not uh, really um, possible for us to have a white actor. So I played the part. Of course, I was very excited to play the part. It was a, a major challenge. Um, so in order to do that, 
um, Maynard, who was directing me, Maynard Peters, a very wonderful human being and a, a great um, uh, icon of the theater here, who is not remembered, you know, and uh, I, I am committed to doing that at some point um, soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Maynard Peters was directing that piece of work, and he's, he was my partner. Um, and we had a group called MAD, Music and Drama. And um, the anacronym MAD was uh, really a powerful thing which we presented. And we were quite weirdos at that time. You know, I was quite a young man um, and um, barely 20, 21, taking part in the Blood Knot. And for that, I um, had my hair bleached. Oh, wow. Right. Um, and that um, enabled me to play the light-skinned brother because I needed to bring that contrast. It's a powerful classic of the theater, right? But I was doing an interpretation which was mirroring the moment of my consciousness, of my political consciousness. And I... Um, was very much part of the movement of black consciousness and Steve Beagle. He was um, uh, a confidant, somebody I could talk to, um, somebody who I had to seek permission uh, because, uh, from because he was, um, he was at the medical school and he was um, on the committee that was vetting pieces of theater and so on that came to, to the um, college and uh, to the residency. And um, uh, I spoke with him about doing the blood knot. And uh, we talked a little bit about my interpretation of it and what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we did a performance there, which was mind blowing, mind blowing. You know, um, I can tell you, it was like the audience was coming at us as we were performing. Uh, when I had to say, I'm black all right. What is there as black as me? To equal me, to, to you know, and it was going on that way. I don't remember all the lines, but mm. um, it was so powerful to have said that at that moment when we were searching for a consciousness about who we were and why we were and what we were wanting and to take that into the theater. And then again, we played it at, a, at the Inanda Seminary in Inanda which was a, uh, a black school, um, a high school. And when we performed that play there, it was in the afternoon. And the play takes place within a shack. And on the stage are two beds and the, the little um, um, a lean to where we put the uh, primer stove and uh, the little table. And uh, it was so crowded that on the stage, on the edges of the stage, um, was not the edges of the, of the, uh, the room, but it was the edges of our society. And that all these young girls that were sitting around almost came into that room. They were so enamored by what was going on, so interested, so, in, uh, so involved in the life that we were depicting. And those two critical moments, one at medical school and the one at um, uh, Inanda Seminary that touched me so deeply and altered my thinking about why we make theater, how we make theater, for who we make theater, and so on. So growing out of that is this deep and fervent understanding that theater is an important vehicle to release and enable us to become free, you know? So that was yeah. a powerful thing. And then by 1970, uh, 71, uh, we were doing a musical called It's a Colorful World. And we called it The Mad Show, based on the fact that we were called mad. Yeah. And um, this was uh, an original piece of work. And it was quite something to have done it. Uh, and within three weeks, the musical was banned. It was the first big event in the South African theater calendar when a piece of theater, a script was banned. 
So the police, the security police come and they pull the script away from me and they take, they uh, go around and collect all the scripts that they can. And then I go onto the press and I say, take the scripts, it's in my mind. And I will do the play. I was the producer with Maynard and both of us were very vigorous. We said, no, we will go on with the play. And we did. Yeah. And they didn't know what to do. We were packed out, of course, for three weeks. But, uh, you know, when we did that, the police intensified their activities and started to dismantle the work that we were doing by going individually to the company. We had a big company of 35 people and you couldn't, um, you know, be there all the time. So they started to threaten families, um, uh, people's workplaces, people's uh, educational spaces and threaten people to say, get away from that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how, that was the, the first kind of thing. Later on, they do other things, but already in 1969, they had opened a file on me because I dared to do um, yeah. uh, the blood knot. Mm -hmm. And what's more, I dared to do it to an open audience. Mm -hmm. And that is the way we did it. Well, right from 1965, we were performing, 64, when, when I started, all the work we were doing was to an open audience. And we did it through membership. In other words, we never sold you a ticket. You would come and buy a little membership card. And we would give you, uh, not the card, we would give you a program in exchange. You know, and that's how we broke the rules. Yeah. But we were yeah. doing this and let it be known that there are a lot of people that come afterwards that will say we were involved in doing this multiracial thing and so on. We were the first ones to go to court and all that sort of stuff. But I'm saying to you that it happened in Durban long before those guys, you know? So the history needs to be retold. The history needs to be written. And um, that's why I'm happy about what you are doing, you know? so. Having had that experience with the Blood Knot, uh, we, we had three performances. We were doing the world premiere of Athol Fugard's The Family. Now, there were three plays at that time. The Blood Knot, which we were doing. Then there was a group from Cape Town that did Halloween Goodbye, which was another Fugard play. And the third one was done by Athol himself. Uh, it was called The Busman and Liena. Mm -hmm. And this was in the period where, where, where Athol was refused a passport to leave the country. And it was after his performance in 1965, 64 of the blood knot in England, you know, so the blood knot was already carrying a certain kind of aura around it. And um, I must say that we did the first black production um, just four years after Athol's, you know, um, so it was a very interesting thing. But when we did those three plays, we couldn't perform it in one venue because we had booked a, a hall, which was called the ML Sultan um, Cane Growers Hall. And um, the police went there and said, this is not going to be allowed. You cannot have mixed audiences here and so on. So they refused to give us that. And I challenged that because it was an educational venue. It was... Uh, open to anybody to walk in there, if teachers could come there, if students could go there, if lecturers could come of different races, I didn't see what the problem was. In fact, that whole strip on, in Gray Street where the uh, ML Sultan, the Orient College and or, Orient High School and uh, the ML Sultan and a few other schools were there, um, uh, was a gray area and we exploited it because we, we accepted the principle that the theater needed to be open to all human beings. Whether you deny us the opportunity to go on the stage together didn't matter, but that was an important thing. So, um, you know, there's so much I could tell you, but um, <laughs> it's suffice to know that um, uh, after the Colorful World, we, we challenged that, we took it up, uh, we took a case against the um, censorship board now that for a group that uh, was a, a small a group without any kind of uh, base of funds or whatever, we took a case 
We went to the community and we asked. I traveled all over the country. I flew for a hundred rand around uh, the whole country, from Durban to Joburg to Joburg to uh, Cape Town, from Cape Town to PE and back um, for a hundred rand, <laughs> trying to raise money uh, to take this matter to court. Um, we didn't get the money, but we had the goodwill of the uh, people that supported us, uh, the council, uh, junior council, senior council, and we took a case up and we lost the case because the uh, ru ruling was that we, uh, when it was not in our right uh, to be critical of government legislation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's paraphrasing it. But uh, when that happened, uh, I uh, then did a production called Melt One. It was my first venture into something experimental, something different. And um, I, I did it in a hall in Durban, which we used quite often. It's called the Bolton Hall. But um, it was an important uh, event because I broke a new ground and I was doing uh, actuality events. So uh, during that period in 1971, um, at the time that we were rehearsing, uh, Timor, Ahmed Timor, was oh. um, pushed out of the, uh, oh. the window on the 10th floor of John Forster Square. And I took that episode into the theatre. That's what I mean by saying dealing with actuality. Um, mm -hmm. One of my cast members was arrested for um, having spoken to a, an Australian nurse who was white uh, in his car. She was a friend of his and they arrested him. And he disappeared from rehearsals for a couple of days. And when he came, he said, well, this is what they did. We took that into the rehearsal and we, yeah. we explored it, yeah. you know. So, and we explored yeah. um, the base of it. Um, the strength of the whole piece was the, um, the whole issue of um, uh, Sharpville. I, I used that as the base. And we were dealing with the, the idea of, um, a restriction and freedom that uh, we were born in a box and we never moved out of that box and uh, one of the daring things I did was I had a box on set it stood there all the time coffins came in and coffins went out but this box was there and in it was a man sure. and when the piece was over people would come go, go out to buy something and come back thinking that the the performance was still going on and they would come in there and they would open the box and give the guy something, you know, and uh, of course the guy was, was made to understand that, you know, he was in another space. So he had to deal with that moment, but um, it was mm -hmm. that kind of consciousness to make people understand what was happening in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. that is the background that I had, um, which, you know, at that point, I realized after the, um, uh, the file that was open on me and the intimidation that was going on um, almost every, every event we had. And um, uh, when I say intimidation, we were followed all the time by, by uh, security police. And um, when we took the court case and we lost that, and then when, when I did uh, Melt One, which was the first laboratory theater. By laboratory, I mean it was a theater where we were um, dissecting work, uh, putting things within a kind of laboratorium. Um, my own work at that time was very much influenced by the work of uh, Jerzy Grotowski. Um, so, I, I am already starting to do that. Um, so mm -hmm. I decided um, come uh, the end of 1971 that I was going to leave the country mm -hmm. because my education was cut off. Mm -hmm. My opportunities to work in the theater was being squashed. Um, and so I, I managed uh, to get some support from my father and um, he took a loan and enabled me to go to London where I studied to become a director in the theater. Mm -hmm. 
uh, when I return, uh, thinking that my life is going to start all over again, um, it was another story. So it's a big story there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That eventually, um, um, again, it's police um, um, strangulation yeah. of the creative artist. And uh, we were not lazy about it. We challenged them. Mm -hmm. I went in many times on detention uh, over uh, standing the ground for having an open audience or standing the ground for having a black uh, African actor working with me, you know, in the theater. And um, yeah, so at the end of that situation, um, uh, there was some kind of tragic things that happened uh, in the first production that I did. Uh, the police really messed us up and, you know, my, my fellow actor um, reacted very, very um, sadly to that. He, he had to be um, committed um, to a mental home um, as a result of the kinds of uh, struggles we we were engaging in, you know. Um, so when that happened, I then uh, worked with Fats Bukhalani, an actor from Port Elizabeth, and I did uh, The Blood Not Again. And you can imagine now uh, that the contrast is very stark. And I traveled uh, that play ar around the country. And um, um, I was feeling that we couldn't get venues in Durban. What the police did is they went to the guys that ran those venues and stopped us from using it. They actually changed constitutions sure. to disallow us from using those, even though they were in gray areas. So you would see that they were, the Im intimidation was such that people uh, especially, um, you know, those charitable organizations and educational organizations that were running these were not strong enough to, to, to challenge the system. And I realized that I was being uh, forced into a box and that all the training that I was having and so on and all that I wanted to do, I couldn't really do it. And so at that point, I had the opportunity of... Um, uh, a visit from Johannesburg, uh, from Phoenix Players, which was located at Dorkey House, and a guy by the name of um, Ian Bernhard had come to see me and he said, Ben, um, I can offer you a chance to come and work in Johannesburg. So wow. in 1975, I came to Johannesburg. So mm -hmm. Ben comes to Johannesburg. Ben, in Ben's Joburg. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure your um sort of like detailed description of your your personal um growth and, and your, your practice and approach to the to making and how that interconnects with the kind of um arts community that was growing at the time and the connection to like the politics um and um kind of like racial framework um of apartheid and how that like kind of soaked into the work that you guys were doing so yes we really appreciate your like very detailed answer because it helps us to kind of map out um, the kind of arts or cultural landscape of the time and how that intersects with your work, which is, yeah, it's been really great, like, listening to that. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah Krista, you know, um, it's my work, my work in the theatre, if anybody would say to you, is very detailed. So when I talk about it, it's, it's always that I'm able to find, for example, in the George Floyd issues that we are hearing now, mm -hmm. I, I am very detailed, even with uh, the slightest gesture. That's my training and my understanding of the arts and how I work as a director and writer in the yeah. theater. Definitely. 